Good evening, everybody. Welcome once again to a New Republic live stream event. My name is Jason Lincolns. I am the deputy editor of the Soapbox section of TNR's website. I'm really glad to have you on board for tonight's discussion, Making Liberalism Matter. The Biden administration recently signed its COVID relief plan into law. It's a large and discreet package of social provision that has commentators offering comparisons to its forebears, such as the Great Society. But as its name suggests, the Great Society embodied an ambitious agenda of social democratic governance, as did the New Deal, its immediate forerunner, to which Biden's plans and presidency have also been compared, comparisons that the president himself has at times offered himself. But here, toward the end of his first 100 days, these sample sizes, a pandemic relief bill here, a set of infrastructure proposals there, are rather small. And the impediments to big change are very familiar. You have the Senate filibuster, sclerotic beltway institutions, an obstreperous Republican Party, occasionally skittish Democrats, and of course, well-moneyed power centers, including the dozen or so mega donors the New York Times reported on today as contributing one of every $13 of raw political contributions and who are hardly tribunes of the people. Tonight, we're going to discuss the elements of what a new liberal vision of the common good could be, that is, besides just fixing the COVID emergency, one that might address smaller crises, such as student debt and unaffordable health care. And we'll consider how a vision might get enacted and executed. Joining us tonight, we have an esteemed panel of distinguished guests that will, by the end of the night, solve all of these problems and answer all of your questions. Let's welcome them now. Uh, first up, she is a political theorist and a professor in the Charles and Louise Travers Department of Political Science at the University of California, Berkeley. Please welcome Wendy Brown. He earned his doctor doctorate at Berkeley, but decamped for the East Coast soon after, where he now serves as the Henry R. Luce Professor of Jurisprudence at Yale Law School and Professor of History at Yale University. Let's welcome Samuel Boyne. He is a Democratic representative from the 8th District of Maryland, a seat he has held since 2017. And by my requirement, he is fulfilling a personal demand of mine to have at least one panelist on these live streams who once appeared as a guest on my old podcast, So That Happened. Please welcome Representative Jamie Raskin. And finally, he is also from Maryland, but he is not one of the Congressman's constituents. So there's not gonna be any of that awkwardness. I must also welcome TNR staff writer extraordinaire, Osea Nwanebu. Tonight's discussion is going to be about an hour, maybe an hour plus. We hope to cover some interesting ground. We invite all of you watching to submit questions of your own in the TR tool to help ensure this. With that ado aside, let's, let's start talking. Um, folks, uh, there's a lot to talk, talk about today. The, the nascent Biden administration, like I mentioned, it's come out of the gate with a big ticket COVID relief bill. And it's a, it's in a large part of at least one infrastructure bill we've talked about it maybe being divided into two pieces. For all these efforts, he's received some fairly purple prose. Um, perhaps most notably, you have the New York Times, Jonathan Alter, who contended recently that Biden is, quote, the first president since Lyndon Johnson who can rightly be called FDR's heir. Soon we'll know if he squanders that legacy or builds on it, end quote. Um, political punditry practically runs on premature consensus. Um, what can we say right now about these early comparisons? Anyone want to take that one? Well, it's too, it's too soon to tell. Uh, you know, Congress is evenly divided. A lot depends on whether in the relief bill, some of the most important stuff like the relief for child poverty actually uh, gets renewed. And we don't know what will come out on the other side of the sausage factory uh, for the infrastructure bill it, in its first or second element. So I, I think, you know, the en enthusiastic comparisons to FDR and others are all to the good, but we should make sure and watch uh, and see, especially given that we're, we're dealing with known quantities who are, are, are talking in new ways and we have to see whether they walk in new ways too. It's really fair to say that um, when Biden emerged on the scene, was running for re-election that we didn't see any of this coming. I think that there was never really a promise of like FDR sized presidencies until much later down the line. I remember the sort of decisive primary victories that Biden had 
took place in mainly in states in which he hadn't competed. It just seemed to me like America uh, at that point in time, I remember very distinctly being in that kind of liminal space uh, between like the reality of the pandemic arriving on these shores and it finally happening. Uh, a friend of mine said it was like America decided to throw the kill switch on the democratic primary process and just anoint Biden the, the president. Um, and the stuff that has come, this purple prose I referred to is, has come after that. To what do you attribute this sort of like lingering desire to be that ambitious as a president? Anyone, anyone may take. Well, I, would just, I would just say two things. I mean, I, I, I think whether any of us supported Biden or not in the primaries, what has taken us all by surprise is that he's governing well to the left of the center. And we thought he would drive down the center, continue to carry on about bringing the country together, um, and in some ways consider or continue the, the, um, the Obama mistake, which is to try to unite rather than to try to drive big packages and big ambitions through a very thorny political process. And he's doing the latter. So um, I, you know, I think those of us on the left can only be glad because it does two things. One, I think it, it, it opens the space for the legitimacy of this kind of politics, big spending, big ambitions, big social, political, and economic equality plans from voting rights to alleviation of poverty, to educational equality, to, to, to true national health care, and so forth. So for all of his temperateness in the primary, we're, we're seeing something else. We're seeing him actually pick up precisely the agenda that social movements have um, put, put before us. And whether or not they succeed, the fact that that is now the contemporary legitimate Democratic National Party discourse and legitimate national discourse, I think just makes a huge difference. So um, it's, it's not a question of will he get all of this or not, but the fact that you know, this has become normal politics now. And that has not been the case, I would say, for 40 years, not since the real neoliberal revolution. Congressman Raskin, we, uh, Biden does definitely deserves credit in terms of the COVID relief bill for getting that top dollar amount that he sought. Um, we all remember that when it was Obama, when Obama came to office, it was offering his own stimulus package. It did get nibbled a bit down by the various ducks in Congress. Uh, Biden held the line. Do you think that that in and of itself is reason to be optimistic that some bold new kind of politics is possible? Uh, you're muted. I'm. No worries. It's bound yeah, to happen. I, I I agree very much with what Wendy just said. Uh, I think that um, first of all, um, Biden is governing um, against the background of a very progressive Democratic Party. When you look at the people who are actually in it at the state level, at the local level, in Congress, it's a very progressive party that wants to engage in pragmatic intervention in the economy and the society to save people. And the, uh, the crises of the time are massive and overwhelming. I mean, Donald Trump brought us to essentially becoming a failed state. Like when you look at what happened with COVID-19, uh, the definition of a failed state is a state that fails to deliver the basic goods of existence to its people and hundreds of thousands of people died unnecessarily in the wealthiest country on earth with the best scientists on earth. And we have become like a failed state with respect to climate change and with respect to healthcare. We're just not delivering the goods to the people. And so I think it's a combination of the magnitude of these crises, the fact that the progressives provide the intellectual energy, the political volunteering, the money, through uh, the internet, uh, the volunteer space, the youth movements, you know, all the civilizing movements of the time. Um, so I, I don't think that Biden's really got much choice in terms of where he's gonna go. And, you know, I mean, Franklin D. Roosevelt, you know, was a patrician who also surprised everybody. 
right? I mean, the, what's this uh, great biography, a traitor to his class? Um, you know, a lot of people didn't, they expected him to be a playboy, you know, kind of, you know, man about town kind of figure. And then part of it was, um, you know, uh, his, his disability and his ability to identify with dispossessed underdog people and then part of it was just the social movements of the time and so i think that that's the political reality that biden finds himself in and it's a to my mind it's a very uh uplifting and affirming thing what's going on in our party as good pressing and demoralizing to look and see what's happening in the republican party which has become much like a modern American political party and much more like a religious cult of personality with one guy who dictates to everybody, you know, who's going to get money and who's not and what you're going to believe on this day and what's not and what you're not going to believe. I mean, 2020 was remarkable for a lot of reasons, but one of them most remarkable in my, to my mind was the fact that the Republican Party for the first time in its history did not have a platform. They just said, Donald Trump's our platform. You know, whatever he says is what is what goes. So uh, it's a dangerous situation in terms of the whole body politic, but in terms of the Democratic Party as closely aligned as, as the, our numbers are in the House and in the Senate still, uh, we're maintaining a lot of unity and a lot of poise and political direction uh, towards progressive ends. Lucida, I know you've contended directly with the Jonathan Alter's um, sort of uh, melodramatic read of the situation and have been given to wonder um, if there is a non-COVID type of agenda uh, that might be as bold and as big and as immediate and as pressing in its intensity as the COVID package. I was wondering if you have had any further thoughts since uh, you wrote that piece for us. Well, I, th I think the Congressman is right to say that we as a nation are facing multiple intersecting crises. The, the brief here tonight is uh, making liberalism matter. And one of the difficult things about American political discourse is that there are two different meetings for liberalism that are always rubbing up against each other um, when we talk about politics. On the one hand, in conventional parlance, liberalism refers to a system of economic provision you know, the welfare states, doing things to regulate the economy, that kind of thing. On the other hand, liberalism in a political theory sense means you're referring to a, a basic framework of individual rights, a belief in the dignity of every individual. It seems to me that Biden is coming into the White House, getting his administration, with both of these conceptions of liberalism in crisis. On the one hand, obviously, we're in the middle of an economic situation uh, that he's done a little bit to alleviate. I think that the COVID bill was, was great in a lot of ways. And as Samuel said, it's going to be a matter of seeing whether or not some provisions like the child tax credit are actually extended. Um, but it's also a crisis that they think has exposed a lot of vulnerabilities within the existing American welfare state and has shown us how much it's crumbled over the last 40 or so years in American politics, how that vision of liberalism established by FDR has been left to decay. On the other hand, the liberalism in the sort of individual rights sense, I mean, look at what's happening across the South when it comes to the right to vote. Uh, look at what's happening when it comes to the dignity of immigrants who are trying to enter the United States as refugees. Um, we just had this verdict come down today in the Derek Chauvin trial. Look at what's happened in the past year that it's opened people's eyes to uh, the amount of police brutality we have in this country. Uh, look at what's happening across the country when it comes to transgender rights and Republicans trying to legislate those away. Um, we're, we're at a point where both conceptions of liberalism, it seems to me, are actually under attack. Um, and it's not an attack that started yesterday, it's not an attack that started with Donald Trump, but it, you know, it's, it's an attack that Biden, I think, his presidency is going to depend upon how he responds to both intersecting crises. And I don't really have a lot of confidence so far that, that people in Washington fully understand the magnitude of what we're facing. As a country, I'm encouraged by the Biden administration so far. I think he is listening to progressives. I think that you've seen clear improvements over Obama when it comes to, again, the, the COVID rescue package, uh, though it's coming up in the infrastructure bill. There is a real boldness there, willingness to spend heavily, and you know, less fear of deficits. Um, at the same time, I, I think it's very difficult for a 
informing political observers not to be troubled and disturbed by what's happening in the Senate and the fact that we have an institution that is basically by design producing outcomes that are becoming less and less tenable, you know, if we're going to call ourselves a democracy. It doesn't really seem to me like there's a real seriousness yet um, about that problem. We've had lots of Democrats come out over the past couple of weeks or so and say, well, we're, we oppose the filibuster and we think we ought to change it. Biden's come out and said, move to a talking filibuster. Manchin said, come out, move out to a talking filibuster. Talking filibuster in and of itself doesn't actually solve the 60 vote threshold issue. Um, but that aside, I, I, I think that we are at a place where our institutions are preventing us from acting decisively to preserve both visions and both understandings of liberalism. And the real test of Biden's presidency is how decisively he acts as a leader to resolve those crises and, and to pull the American uh, people forward. Obviously, um, regardless of what happens in Washington, a lot of what will set the stage for the possibility of a new order in terms of social democracy is happening outside of DC. It's happening in uh, venues across the country in terms of voting rights. I feel like uh, today's news uh, in the uh, Chauvin trial, um, I think that I think I think that you know the, the there was like sort of like the sigh of relief that a jury found this policeman guilty, but it does seem like such a tiny step in the right direction. I know, uh, Professor Brown, you were keen to talk about this and relate this and tie this back into our larger discussion today. Well, it's a tiny step, but it's a historic day. A white cop was convicted of murdering a black man. This is a historic day. And I have lost count, somebody here might have the count, of how many white cops have gone free of these kinds of murders. What made that possible? Black Lives Matter made that possible. I mean, there's just no question about it. So. On the one hand, Osita is exactly right. Our institutions are a mess. The Supreme Court is a mess. Gerrymandering has made voting into a mess, even apart from other forms of voter suppression. Um, certainly the filibuster and other aspects of institutional uh, rules, norms, and broken norms have made our major political institutions for representative democracy, a mess. But there is another, another democracy, and I want to separate it from both meanings of liberalism that Osita um, beautifully parsed for us. I mean, liberalism comes to us from the Latin liberales, which, as Osita says, um, has already two meanings packed into it. And one is freedom, but the other is generosity and magnanimity. It was never equality. It was generosity and magnanimity. And that was assumed in the Latin classical world and Greek classical world to be uh, the qualities of a free man. So it has built into it uh, an elite, uh, a, a separation of, of, of what freedom is for um, from this other understanding of liberalism, equality or expanding um, inclusion and so forth. And what's important about that is that at this point, those two meanings of liberalism, I think, have very much split between the two parties. The right has, has um, grabbed onto freedom as individual rights, including um, rights that mostly horrify the left, not just gun rights um, and not just corporate rights, and, 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 and not just the right to do and say and be anything you want, even if you do hurt somebody, which violates the original precept of liberalism, but also so-called religious liberty, which is now just being used to re-Christianize the nation, not, not to actually expand uh, freedom of conscience. So there's liberty over there, and then there's equality um, sort of um, animating uh, a, the, the Democratic Party, but there's another democracy, which is the democracy of the streets. And, and that is the democracy that the democratic um, emergence of a people saying, no justice, no peace, 
saying um, climate change cannot be addressed by simply tinkering with the levers of capitalism. It has to be addressed in a different way, in a, in a fulsome, in a, in a way that actually will transform the way we live, the way we produce, the way we extract, the way we heat our houses, the way we, we have our energy grids and our transportation grids and so forth. So I want to suggest that the, the Chauvin trial and the outcome today is one of those beautiful moments where instead of people feeling powerless when they go and rally and chant and, and, and make demands and, and congregate and assemble, it's actually one of those moments like Occupy that changed the political conscience and consciousness of part of the country. Now, of course, there's another part, and I'm sure we're going to get to that. We need to talk about the 70 million Trump voters. We need to talk about what's happening over in the papers and the news domains that some of us force ourselves to look at daily, whether Newsmax or Fox or other or 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 um, Breitbart or more extreme than that. There's other things going on, but, but what has happened, I wanna suggest, is not just that the Democratic Party is animated by a progressive vision, but there's, in, in everything from the Sunrise Movement to the, the um, Movement for Black Lives, um, to, to many others that we could name, uh, an insistence on saving this world and making it both more just and, and more likely to have a future. And that is a different, different energy and a different um, power than the one we need to also bring to figuring out how to repair or transform our institutions. Sorry that went on for so long. No, it's fine. It's, you know, it's not hard to surmise that a lot of what's happening in terms of like people on the streets, people powered movements uh, is being informed by a critical mass of young people who grew up in the shadow of the financial crisis and two wars uh, you know, Biden has announced that he's going to draw down troops uh, on the 20th anniversary of September 11th from Afghanistan. This is a war that has, you know, obviously grade school children uh, who were alive when the war began and maybe the adults in their lives said, don't worry, we'll solve this problem, have instead been able to come of age and uh, go and fight in those same foxholes. Um, and I, you definitely, I definitely think it's hard to not attribute uh, moments like today uh, to the reality of a big mass movement on the street. Um, Congressman Raskin, how much salience um, in Washington right now do these big sort of like people power movements have as far as describing <clears throat> what legislators do and say? Well, I, I think they frame our objectives and agenda. Um, you know, the, the overarching crisis of our, you know, it's not even really an issue. It's the whole context within which we've got to decide the public policy issues. Um, I do believe that Black Lives Matter and the traditional civil rights movement and organizations have uh, transformed the discourse around everything from law enforcement policing to, um, economic justice, environmental justice, the, the voting rights. Um, I mean, I look, I, I define uh, our party as the heir to the civilizing movements of the last half century, the civil rights movement, the women's movement, and the LGBTQ movement, the labor movement, the environmental movement, the human rights movement, so on. And, and I think that that, that, that vision uh, would be dominant within today's Democratic Party. Um, and you know, the, the real issue, I think, is the relationship between liberalism and democracy, because th there is a, a right wing version of liberalism, which is just about my property rights and, um, you know, my personal rights, um, which leaves out that other dimension of liberalism. But it also leaves out democracy. Um, you know, the, I mean, our Enlightenment revolution uh, gave us a liberal Republican um, slave society um, because lots of people were just written out of the social contract. And so it is the democratic movements that have transformed liberalism. And that's the challenge to 
uh, make democracy and liberalism stand together. And they stand best when they do stand together. Um, and, uh, you know, I, having been on the floor of the House during January 6th, I saw a vision of uh, right wing mobocracy without any concern for um, other people's political rights or the rule of the majority in reality. Uh, it was fascistic. Um, uh, but, you know, we also know what it's like to hear the rhetoric of conservatives talking about individual rights and property rights and leaving out the, the real rights, the social and economic and political rights of millions and millions of people. So I think the central terrain of struggle here is over the right to vote, the right to participate in who gets to be part of democracy. And all of these anti-democratic levers, which the GOP now is expert in manipulating in order to exclude democracy from the equation. And it's the filibuster in uh, the Senate. It's the manipulation of the Electoral College, which has given us two popular vote losers in the last six elections, and which also created the occasion for this fascist insurrection on January 6th. Um, it is the gerrymandering of our congressional districts, which they, um, they just live and thrive by. Uh, you know, HR1, our democracy reform bill, puts that front and center to mandate independent redistricting commissions in every state and union. And the Republicans openly oppose it, deplore it, and denounce it, saying we want to turn it over to, you know, pointy-headed uh, uh, technocrats, and they want the people's own representatives, i.e. them, to continue to draw the districts uh, for their own purposes. But when I was over in the Senate for the impeachment trial, one of the things I learned uh, I had never focused on it this way before, but the, the Democrats talk about is either 50 Democrats, 50 Republicans in the Senate. The Democrats represent more than 40 million more Americans than the Republicans do uh, in the Senate. And that's without even getting to the problem with the filibuster, right? So that means you, you need, you know, you need 51 votes. You need the votes representing, you know, 40 or 45 million more people. Um, and 50, 40 million people less represented can thwart the majority. And then if you if you make it really 60 votes is what you need, you're basically saying a third of the country or less can blockade the social progress of two thirds of the country. Um, so, you know, one way of charting our progress from the founding is getting rid of anti-democratic instruments like indirect selection of U.S. Senators in the 17th Amendment, the exclusion of women, the 19th Amendment, the exclusion of African Americans, race discrimination voting, the 15th Amendment. And so we keep opening up, but we're not remotely there yet because we've still got the Electoral College, which is a nightmare on multiple levels. We've still got the uh, filibuster. We've still got the gerrymandering of congressional districts. And then we've got all of the old fashioned mechanisms of voter suppression, which you know, have returned in a big way with these 350 bills across the country to eliminate weekend voting, early voting, you know, registration of high school students. And Georgia, of course, they just passed this law saying you can't pass a bottle of water to somebody stuck in one of those six hour lines and so on. Like this is the crucial fight because, you know, you're not going to be able to vote environment or pro-choice or civil rights or anything if you can't vote. Um, Professor Morgan, I know I see you guys nodding along, especially to discussion of the Senate. Um, it strikes me that the Senate is really towing up to the threshold of a pure and unsullied legitimacy crisis. Um, this to me seems like a big impediment to installing a new liberal order, a new, uh, uh, or, or new like sort of like wave of social democracy. I think that's true, but you know, I, I don't know if, if we're there yet. I mean, I, 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 I'm with the Congressman and with Wendy on what social movements make possible and driving politicians and making a verdict like today's possible. Uh, but on the other hand, the Democratic Party is not an it, it's a they, and it includes folks like Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema, And it's not obvious that they can get to 50. Uh, let alone 60. So the, the, the filibuster is a, a big deal. 
And as Osita has already remarked, I think we need to add the Supreme Court into the mix uh, as a counter majoritarian institution from, from long ago, but one that's been supercharged now uh, by Mitch McConnell uh, when, when Donald Trump was on the way out. You know, I think liberalism is, is something that uh, can serve a lot of different comers as, as Wendy's pointed out. I think there are source resources in the tradition of liberalism and frankly, far reaches of it that we have not yet explored. Um, and so I think we, we need to treat it as, as less something that is fixed and, and knowable as something that we're kind of redefining. And the trouble is that liberals were for a long time uh, against democracy and American liberals, you know, who made the constitution are responsible for some of the hurdles to democracy we're now facing and indeed to the realization of some of our most cherished liberal ideals. Uh, so I think it's a, a time of reckoning, not just for the enemies of liberals, but liberals themselves as they come to grips with the things they've imposed on themselves. And that includes a lot of these counter majoritarian checks. You know, I just wanna add if, if we're putting anti-democratic institutions on the board here in a list, we need to put the Senate itself for the very reason that Jamie mentioned, which is uh, that two senators per state is an anti-democratic move and we know what it emerged from and we know what it has to do with the slaveholding South, just like we know that about the filibuster. We also need to put on the board, Puerto Rico and Washington DC. So we have um, a, a, a lot like deeply built in to our institutions that is anti-democratic. And then we have the more recent corrosions and corruptions, politicizations and, and, and uh, degradations. And we have just, we could call it the open-handedness now of the Republican party in aiming at voter suppression. And I would also just say voter strangulation. Um, it's so open-handed that um, it's, it's it hasn't been this open-handed, I think, since the 50s and before that since, um, since Reconstruction. So um, it's a crisis, but it, but it also, crises like this expose things. I mean, it's exposing the extent to which what Jamie described as, as a, a, a battle to, to empower and include marginalized and suppressed groups, but also marginalized and suppressed problems. We haven't, we haven't talked at all about capitalism and climate change. And um, if we don't, we're gonna just go on talking as if those things don't exist, but those, those also have to be brought front and center. And of course, that's gonna be the limit of the Biden administration. Capitalism may be forced into a redistributive politics that it hasn't faced for many years, but it's not going to be fundamentally challenged and regulated to produce a, a, a sustainable future by the Biden administration. That's gonna to have to come again, I think from below and from the rest of the world. Anyway, my main point was the Senate, Puerto Rico, Washington, DC, if we're just to stay within mainstream institutions of, of deeply anti-democratic features of our current system, I would put those three things there. Let's see, I know you've been contemplating statehood lately. I was wondering if you had anything to add to that. There's not much more to say about it. I mean, Puerto Rico, um, if they'd like to be a state, should be a state. The district has already made its voice uh, heard on that question many times. <laughs> DC should also be a state. The other territory should be offered the same. Um, you know, I think Wendy is right. I, I'm fond of pointing out now that one of the last public statements that Congressman Don Dingell, the longest serving Congress in American history, made before he passed away was uh, an excerpt from his memoir he published in The Atlantic, where he called for the abolition of the United States Senate. Uh, John Dingell, to my knowledge, was not a, a radical Marxist or a kind of hair on fire <laughs> activist. He was not somebody with my kind of uh, political uh, disposition, but I think he, even he was capable of recognizing that the institution poses a real problem for the stability of, of the system and, and for, you know, our ability to call ourselves a democracy. And that wasn't something that he said was going to happen tomorrow or in 10 years, but he's framed it as a generational struggle. And I think it's one that we should 
take up. I do want to talk a little bit about capitalism um, and liberalism and, you know, to circle back to talk a little bit more about the right as well. Um, I think I'm mean enough to the Democratic Party in my writing so I can give it kind of a break today and, and, <laughs> and, and, and talk a little bit more about the state of the right. Um, this question of its orientation to liberalism has always been very interesting to me. Um, and, and the way I've always kind of seen it is that the American conservative movement is, and really conservative movements all across the world, are animated by values that precede and actually, in many cases, supersede liberalism and individual rights. I think the fundamental belief of a conservative is that there are certain hierarchies within society that are worth protecting and preserving. There are certain values in society and traditions that are worth protecting and preserving. And any kind of policy that will get you to a place where those values, those hierarchies are secured is going to be good policy. Now, when contemporary capitalism kind of emerged, it happened to be the case that the people who were winning out in that system were the kinds of people conservatives thought should be running society anyway, sort of white male Christian CEOs and business leaders. Well, now it's happening. Now you have black CEOs. Now you have corporations that are sponsoring the pride parade. And on cue, you have in the conservative movement this reaction to woke capital, this, this sense that the economic system that we have been supporting for the past however many decades is no longer worth taking for granted. And we should really start sticking it to these corporations. Why? Because they're animated by a set of principles that precedes property rights and individual rights. They're not interested in the property rights of Twitter and Facebook, right? Those are things they're willing to give away. They're not interested in free speech rights. They're willing to legislate constraints on them to make sure the wokes are not getting uh, too much of a, of a say in our universities, right? All of those individual rights are contingent. And the real thing that, that matters to them is making sure that the people who've controlled American society for the majority of its history continue to control it. Um, and so for me, there's always been the kind of very steady through line right from Edmund Burke, you know, in the, 18th, the 18th century, all the way through Donald Trump. I mean, what is Donald Trump saying? But we need to make sure that the people who are making decisions in American society, people who we allow into American society, are people who represent and are part of the existing majority, racial composition, religious composition, et cetera. Um, that to me is conservatism. That is what it's all about. And so if you're, if you're trying to understand the kind of bizarre things we've been seeing from the conservative movement over the last several months or so, the kind of cult-like behavior the congressman described, I think it is animated by that tension, that sense that the economic system that conservatives had been protecting have actually been deleterious to their social and cultural priorities. And now there has to be some kind of response. There are people in the Republican Party who are going to resist that shift. Mitch McConnell is not somebody who's going to step away from big business, you know? Um, I think that a lot of what somebody like Josh Hawley says is performative, but I do really think that there is a generation of conservatives who are coming up now that are really not taking laissez-faire principles for granted and are reshaping conservative politics in really kind of frightening and unsettling in new ways. And that's gonna be something that we're gonna to have to watch as guardians of liberal values and democracy in the years ahead. I mean, that raises a good point. Have The Trump era was kind of characterized by being a time in which we all thought of Trumpism as a key singular threat to the United States uh, liberal order. Um, but it does not seem to me that the threat has necessarily subsided meaningfully since his departure from the scene, even though he has very much departed from the scene. He has been, you know, sequestered away at Mar-a-Lago and banned from very social media accounts. He's been, it's been a disappearing act for the ages. But at the same time, uh, I see, we talked, I see, I see the rivulets of Trumpism flowing everywhere. Um, most notably, I, I, I think about the uh, law that was just passed in Georgia to curtail voting rights. It does many things. We've already talked about how it, how it, you, it, it, it bans being able to hand water to somebody. But one of the things that I think was key to me was the way the law allowed the sort of governing body currently controlled by Republicans to overturn or oversee or overrule decisions made on the local level by various 
district boards, essentially taking that uh, Donald Trump seeking 11,000 additional votes from Brad Raffensparger, uh, which was deemed to be unsight, unseemly, and of course, illegal at the time, and making it proper and legal, essentially taking that thing that we said should never be done, and not only allowing it to be something that could be contemplated, but should be contemplated by any rational actor that wants to seek power. Um, <clears throat> so to what extent, we really can't say that we're completely out of the woods yet, as far as the Trump era goes. And, and well, I actually think that it's probably meaningless to call it the Trump era. It really is the conservative era. Can, can I take a shot at this one, Jason? Absolutely, take a shot. Yeah, I mean, I agree completely with your question. Um, you know, far from it being over, I think we're just getting started now. I mean, people on our side would like to think that what happened on January 6th was um, a closing chapter in some nightmare we lived through. Um, the people on the right see it as essentially a declaration of war and promise. And, it, you know, the, the, they, they celebrate January 6th the way that Donald Trump did in his final tweet of the day, where he said, you will always remember this day. We will always remember this day and you are heroes. Um, and, you know, at the trial, we tried to get them to commit to, um, uh, well, we tried to get Trump to testify, of course, he wouldn't come, but uh, to get the lawyers at least to denounce it, the lawyers denounced it, but we can never get them to say they were denouncing it on behalf of Trump himself. And sure enough, within the last few weeks, Trump has been saying, oh, uh, my supporters went in uh, to the Capitol and they were hugging and kissing the Capitol officers. I'm like, well, they weren't hugging and, and kissing the 160 who ended up in the hospital uh, because they were getting beaten up with Confederate battle flags and Trump flags and hit over the head. Um, so, um, but the, the Republicans are going along with that. There's a determined effort to whitewash what happened, which means, of course, to sanitize it. One political scientist sent me an article showing that the the, the best um, indicator of a successful coup is a recently failed coup because the forces that engineer the coup are able to determine the weaknesses in the state apparatus and get an appetite. And sure enough, if you look on the right wing websites, they're all out there saying stuff like this was not an armed insurrection. If we had wanted to take control, we would have because we can. And that's the attitude that Trump has spread on that side. So look, I think that we shouldn't understate what we significantly accomplished at the trial. Uh, we convicted him in the court of public opinion. We convicted him in the court of history. And we had the most bipartisan impeachment conviction vote in the Senate in US history. There've only been four uh, impeachment trials, uh, Andrew Johnson, Bill Clinton, Trump one and Trump two. And this was by far the most bipartisan. We had uh, 10 Republicans vote with us to impeach on the House side. Seven uh, Republican senators joined us to convict, but he beat the constitutional spread. He, we didn't make it to two thirds. And so the democracy itself is left in this ambiguous kind of gray zone now. Um, he appears to have been repudiated and discredited by convincing bipartisan majorities. On the other hand, he continues to be an absolute hero and cult leader uh, on the right and within the Republican Party, um, which has now doubled down on the tactics of voter suppression and elimination of the power of the Democratic majority um, and specific groups within it. So th that's where we are now. But you know, now is the time for us to be fighting at every single level of government and in every state. Um, I'm, I'm happy to report to Osita and Wendy. I just got back from uh, leading the, the floor um, action on DC statehood. We brought it out of the rules committee today um, and uh, we're gonna pass it overwhelmingly. That's a huge shift within the Democratic party. When Eleanor Holmes Norton brought it out in 1993, it was defeated two to one uh, and lots and lots of Democrats voted against it. Uh, one Republican actually supported it from Eastern Shore, Maryland. Today, no Republicans support it, but every Democrat uh, supported it last year, except for one. And we think we're gonna get 100% now. 
Um, and I think if, um, if Puerto Rican statehood gets moving the way that it should, it'll be the same thing there. We're talking about millions of American citizens who are disenfranchised and not represented. And the people of Puerto Rico saw what that meant during Hurricane Maria when Trump had denied them hundreds of millions of dollars that was supposed to be coming to them and you know, tossed them some paper towels. And basically the same thing happened to DC in COVID-19. DC was not treated as a state and lost $700 million, which when we won the election and Biden came in, we were able to reverse. But there are real uh, meaningful implications of that kind of disenfranchisement. So people should not underestimate what that will mean if we can get these things done. Anyone want to follow up? I, I, I think you're right, Jason, that, that Trump changed everything. And I think we can think of him changing both parties uh, in very different ways, driving both of them, though, beyond their historic neoliberalism. Uh, you, you know, the, 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 the right was based on so-called fusionism, an alliance of economic liberals and social conservatives. And, uh, you know, with, with Josh Hawley and such, you know, calling for the Republicans to become a working class party, uh, you, can, you can see it, something extraordinary happening. I agree completely with Osita that this is frightening, but also unconvincing on its own terms. Um, the question is, what are the Democrats doing? And I, you know, if you go back to the New Deal, one of the best books about it is called Fear Itself. Analysts have talked about a reformism of fear that drives liberals when they're running scared. And January 6th has something to do uh, with that new attitude, um, but so does losing in 2016. If you look at recent statements, even on the record by staffers like uh, Brian Deese and uh, Jake Sullivan, they say outright that they have the humility of the defeated, their old policies in the Democratic Party fail to be seen by the electorate as serving enough people. And so what we're seeing is, you know, a, a, a reform that is in part driven by fear of what will happen and the right winning if the Democrats don't become a credible uh, a party, at least moving towards its working class roots. I would just add that, um... I think it is important now to, to, to grasp the deeply anti-democratic force animating not just the Republican party, but um, a, a rank and file, if you wanna call it that, of um, what Osita identified as conservatism, but I would, I would like to expand a little bit to say it's, yes, it's invested in hierarchy, authority, for the most part, Christianity, but the, the deeply anti-democratic right-wing forces that have erupted around the world in the past 20 years, especially the past 10, are animated in part by the sense that the sandbar on which white male supremacy is standing is washing away, but also, of course, animated by exactly what Sam just mentioned, which is what not just political abandonment of working and poor people entailed, but what neoliberal globalization did to working and middle class and poor people. Um, not just lowering incomes, but gutting social states. And when you combine that um, sliding down the ladder rather than a sense of climbing up it with the shrinking sandbar, you have a recipe for reaction. So yes, it's invested in authority, hierarchy, tradition, religion, et cetera. But even those who, are not deeply religious, are not, are, are, are not traditional in their values, are part of that reaction. And that's what we're seeing in everything from the Proud Boys to the Yellow Vests in France. And I, I think we need to see the whole stew 
um, or what Stuart Hall used to call the conjuncture of, of these economic, political, and social forces, combined with one more thing, which is the sense that there's an evaporating horizon for the future. And so even those who deny climate change, even those who, who reject, who, 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 who reject the idea that you can't go back to some mythological time in the 1950s when men were men and, and whites were whites and everybody else bowed to them. Even those people, I think, what, what, you, what you can find if you poke a little bit is a sense that the world is ending. And what you get then is a no holds barred, why would you care about democracy? And why would you care about majorities? And why would you care about institutions or anything else? That's full on nihilism. And I'm not saying these are people who themselves have attitudinal nihilism. I'm saying it's a nihilism that comes from a lost sense of, of a progressive history or a lost sense of, of meaning and value that, that is um, stable and instead reaction against everything that seems to be threatening this world, whether it's global government, which is attached to climate change, or whether it's immigrants or uh, the, the enthronement, marginal enthronement uh, that is enfranchisement of those who previously have been disenfranchised by virtue of race, gender, et cetera. So that's the crisis in the social fabric. And then we have the terrible erosion of the political fabric that we've been talking about now for 45 minutes. I, I want to get to some uh, viewer questions, but uh, I have to say that like in general, um, what I'm hearing today from everybody to a certain extent is that uh, as we're contemplating the possibility that uh, a Biden administration uh, might touch off some kind of new order that shapes up into something that broadly restores our civic fabric, um, we're doing all this really kind of within sight of the razor's edge in a way that I think people maybe don't appreciate. Um, with, with that in mind, do we think that liberalism right now is still the best possible framework for this restoration? Or, or let me put it um, another way, how hale would we say the prospects of this kind of restoration are? I think that political values have to have a kind of material and structural foundation capable of securing them, personally. Um, it, it's, it's all well and good to believe in individual rights and individual dignity, but if you have an economy that isn't structured in a way that actually provides people with agency uh, and provides people with a say at work and that allows corporations to uh, influence the political proce pro processes to, the, to their ends at the expense of the people, then you don't really have a system capable of, of protecting individual rights and, and liberties. So, you know, that's, that's kind of what I would say. I think it, it, it's not enough to just sort of espouse these values and, and to say that we, we believe in them and, and we take them seriously. I think you have to actually look to the ways, and, and I think that Wendy's just, you know, talked about this eloquently. You have to look to the ways in which the structure of our economy and our, our institutions actively our intention with those values and also the ways in which our economy and institutions can turn people against those values. Um, I don't think that there has been a sufficient amount of attention to that end of things, right? There is looking at what's happening on the right and being appalled by it and saying we have to defeat it. But as far as the engines of inequality that Wendy has just pointed out. I, I, I'm not sure that we're fully there in terms of really reimagining the economy in a way that's going to sustain these values moving forward. Again, I think that there are reasons to be optimistic about, well, I don't know if I'm optimistic, but I think there are reasons to praise the Biden administration's policy response so far, again, to the coronavirus pandemic and some of their proposals. But I think what's still an open question is not, you know, how much money are we going to pour into the welfare state to revive it, but what are we going to actually do to restructure the economy in a way that gives working people in this country power? Uh, the PRO Act is, is still, its fate in the Senate is kind of ambiguous. That's something that would do a lot to revive unions, to give uh, working people a, you know, a leverage in bargaining that they haven't had in, in many decades. Um, 
you know, during the campaign, very briefly, there was a conversation about workplace democracy. I think that conversation should have been a lot longer than it was. I think that that is sort of the final, the next frontier of progressive policymaking. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think that the ideas in themselves are going to be enough. I think that you have to have a foundation um, in the way that we structure, you know, the fabric of our society that, that actually determines whether or not those values are, are, are viable, how long-lived they are, and, and how, how well we see them working in, in actual life. I couldn't improve on what Osita said. I'll just add that uh, to me, everything depends on in a, in a deeply divided country as the last election showed, whether Biden's early steps uh, uh, create a broader constituency than he had at the start. Uh, and I think that really depends in turn, as I started out by saying, on whether he does end up getting political support for the agenda he's announced. We just don't know whether he can yet. Anyone want to add anything to that? Yeah, well, um, I, I like what, what both Osita and Sam said there. Um, I, but I'd be interested, I don't know if somebody wrote this book already, but I'd be interested to read a book about um, the history of American liberalism through the prism of the New Republic. Because one thing that makes me feel real good about where we are right now is where the New Republic is. Uh, because I remember a period where, I mean, it was like, um, ultra muscular Cold War liberalism, uh, denouncing progressives, denouncing uh, radicals and so on, very much on the side of the military industrial complex and corporate power. That, um, again, liberalism in itself can be seen to be a kind of sterile and static sort of political philosophy or ideology, and it's given life and meaning by the movements of the time. And as uh, Osita was saying, by what the underlying um, political content is of, of the days, you know? And um, so I think liberalism stands best with progressivism, with populism, uh, with the antitrust tradition, which has been revived very much on uh, our judiciary committee as we go after um, the big social media giants and their monopolization of knowledge and information uh, technology um, in different ways. Um, the connection between liberalism and environmentalism is gonna be critical as Wendy was saying, um, you know, if we're serious about defending civilization and you know, I think that that is a, a pretty core liberal value <laughs> to defend civilization and humanity. Um, and then also the relationship with um, uh, peace movements and uh, efforts to get us away from w the war system of always thinking about uh, progress being identified with war and international conflict, thinking of uh, other ways of moving things forward. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm given a lot of hope, at least on the intellectual side of things, by where the new republic is today, because I remember when it was in a very different place. And so uh, that's a pretty cool statement about where liberalism is in America right now. Subscribe to the New Republic. It's a really fantastic answer, I'll, I'll, I'll say. Um, <laughs> I want to do um, just say I'm going to ask a couple questions from the audience tonight. Um, I understand that we're going to probably hit our hour mark if anyone has to depart. Um, totally understand. Uh, but I wanted to keep things going a little bit longer. I uh, wanted to just start because we haven't talked about this, Diana Smith. Um, wanted to know about the sort of role in money uh, in terms of political power and control. I've mentioned at the top of the show how there was a sort of interesting report from the New York Times uh, this week that uh, that sort of like identified 12 people as being contributing the lion's share to all political contributions. It strikes me as being very difficult to sort of like establish a sort of social democratic order uh, when you have this sort of like uh, plutocratic layer calling so many of the shots. Oh, just let gonna, me just say, let, well, I was just going to say legislatively in HR1, uh, we are pushing hard for a, a small donor based public finance system. 
a matching system like the kinds that have been in Maine, Arizona, New York City, I think has it for the mayoral elections, Montgomery County, Maryland has it. Um, it's a critical point. And, um, and, and this actually does force a kind of, uh, you know, identity crisis for liberalism. Uh, you know, is liberalism's position that everybody can just give whatever they want to the heavens, meaning that the wealthiest people can do that and others um, don't or can't? Um, or does liberalism mean that you create a system where everybody gets to participate in a roughly equal way? You know, and um, the, the Citizens United decision has been a nightmare for democracy because it basically transformed every private for-profit business corporate treasury in the country into a political slush fund for the CEOs on the false conceit that they were speaking for the shareholders. Of course, the shareholders are never consulted and don't know anything about it. I did get a provision in um, HR1 uh, which I call Shareholders United, saying that, okay, as long as Citizens United is the law of the land, and we're trying to overturn it by constitutional amendment, but if it's the law of the land, no corporation can spend anything in politics without getting a prior vote, a majority vote of the shareholders of the company, which at least will force a politicization of that decision to put their money into, you know, Mitch McConnell or Donald Trump or whatever they're doing. Uh you know, I think I think the reforms that the congressman is talking about are, are very right. important. Obviously, Citizen United really was a disaster for American democracy, and, and you know everybody talks about money in politics kind of all the time now. Um, I do think that our understanding of what money in politics means should be a little bit broader than we're used to thinking of it in, in conventional politics. I kind of joked earlier today. Um, you know, I was looking at some of the polls that are coming out in, in New York City's mayoral race. Andrew Yang is at the top, uh, other people who've been in New York politics for a very long time were struggling to catch up with him. And the joke that I made was like, oh, well, you know, maybe AT&T has actually launched the campaign uh, of the next mayor of New York. Andrew Yang has been on television for the last year or so since leaving the Democratic primary on CNN as a political contributor, CNN's division of Time Warner, which is a division of AT&T. Uh, most of the political coverage in this country is run by a handful of corporations, or at least the political coverage that most people see. Sadly, most voters in the country are not reading the new republic they're getting their political news from television um and from a handful of companies that are shaping the way that we interpret the news understand the news the way we understand political issues people who are trying to figure out what was going to happen in the derek chauvin trial this afternoon were treated to a couple of hours of just sort of running commentary from cable news anchors just sort of spouting off <laughs> you know about about what they thought about justice and and whether the the verdict was going to be a great coming together and all of that. All of that is money in politics. All of that is influence on the American political system at the hands of corporations that are themselves collecting advertising for other corporations and so on. So, you know, I, I don't know that there is a, a, a nice, neat policy solution to that issue, uh, but it is something that kind of concerns me a lot and that, that I think about a lot because it's it, it is obvious to me that a lot of what we've seen occur in American politics that has really surprised us over the last half decade or so has been a consequence of television. Donald Trump was a television star. That's how people kind of knew him, kind of to understand him as a successful businessman and somebody who was worth thinking, uh, caring about what his opinions were, right? His rallies were carried live <laughs> during the campaign by cable news networks trying to get ratings. Um, all of that, it seems like a real problem to me. This is before you even get to Fox News, which people sort of understand is like a a radicalizing force. I think even more broadly than Fox News, we have a, a media infrastructure in this country um, that is being concentrated in fewer and fewer hands. We've seen an erosion of local journalism, state journalism, uh, over the past 20 years as a consequence of the internet. I wrote a piece recently arguing that journalism is infrastructure, that Biden should put some funding into the next infrastructure bill to, to fund state and local journalism outlets to see if we can do something about that problem as a kind of collective, um, as a kind of collective thing. Uh, but that all of that seems like all, all of that reads to me in my mind is money in politics and ways in which our politics are being shaped even more insidiously. Um, then they're being shaped by the political contributions already sort of tracks on uh, open secrets every every election. I think that the problems we have 
with corporate influence are, are much deeper than that. I had a question for uh, Professor Brown from one of our attendees um, who says that who, who highlights the fact that a lot of your career has been dedicated to a critique of the liberal tradition. Uh, if we're talking about making liberalism matter, what would you say are the aspects of the liberal tradition that you feel most need to be preserved and which should be put by the wayside or even overcome? Well, I think Osita actually answered this question for me about 15 minutes ago. L liberalism, first of all, is terribly protean and neoliberalism is its own nightmarish uh, reformulation of it. Um, we don't have time to go into those details right now, but if I'm just to answer your question very directly, I think one thing we've learned from the 20th century is that socialism or social democracy, whether on a small scale or on a national scale, or even larger than that, a post-national scale, must also be concerned with democracy as its political form and with individual rights that protect human beings from particular kinds of incursions from states and from one another. But that last thing, which is liberalism, cannot substitute for those other things, which is how to organize an economy not based on growth, because that's a disaster for the planet, and not based on extractivism and profit, because that's a disaster for the planet and for equality. So how to organize an economy that provides for human needs and tends the planet and how to organize a political form that we can loosely call democratic, but we don't know exactly what that would look like at a post-national scale or a sub-national scale. So how to organize a political form in which the people really do govern, but within the limits of what's sustainable for the planet and what protects individual rights on the other hand. So that was a long winded way of saying what I would extract from liberalism as we develop viable visions for the 21st and 22nd century is a concern with protecting individuals from incursions that are egregious, that are cruel, that are suppressing um, capacities for creativity and independence and individuality. But on the other hand, Liberalism won't take us the whole way toward what we also are, which is social interconnected creatures, interconnected both with each other and interconnected with the viability of the planet as a whole. So we need some liberalism, but we need it contained. Uh, we need it restricted to the protection of individual rights, but we can't have rights be Trump, as it were, against all of these other needs, or we won't have a future to live in. I wanted to just ask if anyone had any final thoughts on today's topic. I know we've covered a lot of ground. There's so much more we could talk about, um, but I just wanted to uh, sort of like take this to the final thought stage of our panel. No, I think we solved liberalism. I think we figured it out. Actually, I think we did it. I had a feeling we might. Um, <clears throat> Well, with, with that, we will draw tonight's uh, live stream to a close. I want to thank all my guests, Sita, Congressman Rask, and uh, Professors Moyne and Brown for being here. Um, I look forward to having you guys back on for future discussions. Uh, I think that, you know, we're, we're not gotten through Biden's first 100 days, just a lot of territory left to traverse. A lot of activity happening outside of, inside and outside of Washington, D.C., Today was a very riveting example of that, and hopefully a riveting example of what people could do on their own in the movements that probably will come to define our future. Um, I'd also like to take a moment to tell our audience that the next TNR live stream event is going to be taking place Thursday evening. It's going to be a much different live stream event than this. Uh, the topic for the next one is called The Oscars in a Pandemic. It's going to feature TNR staff writers Josephine Livingston and Alex Shepard along with TNR literary editor, Laura Marsh. It's gonna be moderated by my fellow deputy editor, 
at the critical mass, se critical mass section, reuse space. Um, again, this is Thursday, April 22nd, also at 7 p.m. It's going to be about movies, not about liberalism, be a little bit about liberalism, mostly about movies. Regardless, it's free of charge, and I think you'll enjoy it. Um, I want to thank, um, one final thanks to all, all of our guests and to everyone in the audience for tuning in tonight's live stream. I'm really happy to have been able to bring you guys into my home, uh, and I hope to see you all again soon. In the meantime, I hope everyone stays safe and has a wonderful night.